Diamond B Sports presents the American Sports Cavalcade. A panorama of speed, color, drama, and excitement. The American Sports Cavalcade. Galveston, like Houston to the north, is a major port on the Gulf of Mexico. Water plays a dominant role in the life of this historic Texas city. Professional shrimpers, along with merchantmen and pleasure boaters, all coexist to make Galveston a water lover's delight. But for major landlocked events, the motorsports action crowd heads north to the Houston Astrodome. Hello everyone, I'm Steve Evans, and I guarantee you there's plenty of folks from down Galveston Way in the old dome tonight as we bring you the TNT Red Man All-American Truck and Tractor Pulls. Now, you may be asking, why is Steve walking around in a bunch of junk cars on the floor of America's first dome stadium? Well, as the crowd is filing in, we've got a few minutes. Let's go out to Paul Page, who can tell us why. Paul? Paul? Whoa, you are supposed to tell me before you come to me. You're not supposed to just come to me just like that. Steve, this super modified rear wheel drive 6200 pounds we're going to be seeing some action out of these babies big block chevrolet truck chevrolet in here big blower about 1400 horsepower over here the tractor the basis of this sport count this one two four hundred and fifty four cubic inch chevrolet engines and if that's not enough three four plugged in from the side total about 45 4600 horsepower 7200 pound tractor we're also going to see the really newest addition. Take a look up. The monster trucks. And Steve, this gives me an opportunity I've never had before. Now, when I want to conduct an interview, it's all the way up here to the skybox. What do you think, huh? Well, Paul, you may need a skybox so you don't strain your neck when these guys hit the jumps. In this earlier round of qualifying action, the famous Bigfoot raced Clydesdale, and this round was to bring it all down to the toughest eight months the truck. And of course, the truck you're riding with right now, Bigfoot, was the first and is still the most notorious of all the monster trucks in this sport. Racing these trucks head-to-head -head is relatively new, only a little over a year old, but we expect some exciting and maybe unpredictable action here in the dome. We'll have more truck racing and meet the drivers a little bit later in our show. But right now, it's time for pulling. Well, earlier in the evening, we had 10 full pulls all the way down the length of the track in the 6,200-pound two-wheel drive class. Now, we'll have a pull-off among these men, and the officials are adding weight and changing the speed in which the box comes forward. So we have some excitement up and coming. Not only, Paul, have they added more weights and sped up the box, they've also lengthened the pulling distance. Before, it was 275 feet. Everybody exceeded that, we'll be seeing. Now it's out to 300 feet, the distance of a football field. The whole idea, of course, is to make it tougher for everybody because so many were equal in the last round. That brought us to this pull-off, and now as they make things harder, they make them heavier, they'll make this pull-off very, very tough, and that'll determine the best of the best. Well, the weight transfer device, or the sled, as most people call it, is all set up and ready, and here comes the first to hook. This is Ken Lamont out of Crossville, Illinois. Paul? The machine is the Midnight Express. It's a Chevrolet, 575 cubic inches, developing 1,700 horsepower. Ken started tractor pulling when he was 12 years old. Here he is now in the Astrodome. He's probably looking at a crowd. Back when he was 12, he never envisioned being interested in this sport. And when he was 12, he was in some beat-up old second-hand pickup truck. Take a look at this custom-built pulling machine. All right, now he is hooked up to the sled. They have uh, connected an electrical device to the back of this truck so that would kill the engine should he come disconnected from the sled. He'll take the slack out. That's a huge supercharger you see there. And here is the next puller, Wayne Rouse. He's looking on, trying to pick up some tips on the techniques that this course is going to require. Okay, Ken Lamont is underway. He very carefully and slowly feeds the power to the truck. Now the hammer is down. Wayne Rouse looking on. Let's get the distance as the sled drags Midnight Express to a stop. Well, Steve, here's Wayne Roush, and he got a, a view of that. What do you think? That was a nice pull. It's going to be hard to beat. What's your chances of beating it? Well, we're going to drop the gear and let it grab up a little bit and see what happens. All right, Wayne, good luck to you. Thank you. 
Wayne moves away now, puts in his earplugs as he's ready for his pull. Down at the other end, Ken Lamont unhooks his machine. Let's take a look at that run. Now, take a look at that box up on the back of the sled, and look how fast it comes rolling forward. That's transferring weight right onto the back end of the puller. Makes it very, very difficult. So one run complete in the pull-off, Ken Lamont at 282.9 feet. Let's go to Steve. Ken Lamont first in the pull-off, 282 feet. That box moved much faster on the sled forward, transferring that weight. It was a tough one. Yeah, it was an awful tough hook. Uh, I might have messed up. I tried a real fast gear. That's why I loaded the motor and got the jump. on board, fires his machine, his pull is coming up next. We're at the Astrodome in Houston, Texas for the TNT Red Man All-American. I'm Paul Page with Steve Evans and there's a magnificent crowd here to see the finest tractor pulling in the world. Wayne Rouse backs up, ready to participate in the pull-off. Earlier, he talked with Steve Evans. The two-wheel truck class uh, has something for just about everyone. For you traditional hot rodders, how about this 23T of Wayne Roush? Wayne, tell us about it. It's just beautiful. It's got a chrome molly tube frame under it, and um, Keith Black Hemi engine, just like the drag racers use. Uh, very similar to, well, Jim, Jim had built the original motor, and you know what kind of racing he does. Yes, very well-known funny car driver. And um, then after we had the frame built the way we wanted it, by the way, Tim Engler, with the modified tractor frame, uh, built the frame, chromoly tubing frame. It's a little bit different. It has lead weights as compared to the suitcase weights a lot of people use. And you've put those weights in boxes where they're hidden away. Nice. Uh, not for that reason that you might think, but if you take the lead weights and you don't encasement something, they keep breaking and chipping, and this holds them together. Were you a hot rodder at one time with this kind of machine? Did you go back uh, to your boyhood days? No, sir, not really. I've always really liked motorsports. But uh, until I, I had a uh, mini modified tractor before this, but before that, I, I'd never been involved in it. Well, it's a beauty. Thank you. Wayne Roush comes from the same part of Ohio as IndyCar driver Bobby Rahal. That's right, the city of Dublin. He was a former professor at Ohio State University. He loved tractor pulling so much. He said, before I get much older, I'm going to go out and do it full time. And there is Mike Stowe looking on. He's the next to hook. The balance looks a bit off. Wayne Roush has a front end higher than most pullers would like to see it, and it settles down very hard as well. Paul? What do you think? Try to get a little rough on the other end. I don't know. We just have to take a shot at it. Try to get the weight right. You just took a look at your weights. What'd you do? I moved 100 to the front. All right. For the pull-off. Good luck. Thank you. Well, the distance for Wayne Roush is 282.71 feet, and the distance to beat was 282.9, posted by Ken Lamont. So very, very close. Let's take one more look. And again, uh, I emphasize the front end a bit higher than it should have been. See that red box there with a the little latch on it? He wishes now maybe there was about another 100 or 150 pounds inside that block to keep that front end settled down a bit. That's about the attitude you'd like to see it, the entire length of the pull. Back at the starting line, Mike Stowe backs up the bad dog. Now, Stowe has been tractor pulling for about 13 years. A 481 cubic inch engine in that machine develops over 1,100 horsepower. Now, each of these drivers have been watching the track itself as we watch the final adjustments being made to the sled. They've been looking at the track to see where it's soft, where it's hard, where it will hold the bike. And the bowler has the option of positioning that sled just about anywhere in the surface he wants it. There goes the bad dog. The wheel's up in the air, and it is bouncing out of control. Mark Miller next to the pool looking on, and he knows right now, or he's hoping anyway, that his front end isn't too light like Bad Dog and the little Model T. Both of them had exactly the same problem. Just too much weight on the rear end, not enough on the front. Paul? Well, here's Mark Miller, and he sits in the Mini Brood. Mark, let me get you for a minute. The distance is 282.71. Lamont has it. You've been watching. What do you think? I don't know. It's going to be a tough run to beat. What are you reading out of the track? That's a tough track. It's a very rough track. I just hope I can get a smooth run off of it. All right. It's your time. Good luck. Back to you, Steve. Actually, Paul, Ken Lamont's distance was 282.9 feet. They run them off so quick here, Steve, and it's noisy down on the floor. It's tough to keep track of the distance. But at the moment, Ken Lamont has the benchmark. 
The mini brute fires up. This is Mark Miller. You just met him. He is now ready to make his contribution to the pull-off. In the meantime, at the far end, Steve is with Mike Stowe. Well, Mike, you came up a little bit short at 266 feet, but that will put you in third place so far in the pull-off. Yeah, it tracked awful hard then and rough then at the starting line, and I just got to bouncing, and it just I couldn't get it out of it. It's really raw, hard, rough ride and hard run on the truck. It's not something you can get off the throttle a little bit, and it'll settle down. If you do that, you just lose wheel speed momentum. If you ever get out the throttle, once it's hooked, and about 75 to 100 feet, you're done in anyway. You just got to ride it out and hope everything stays together. Hope you hang on to third place money. Thank you. Mike Stowe hoping that that pull of 266 feet is good enough to keep in that third position. In the meantime, here's a man that hopes that he can get number one. Mark Miller, backed up, hooked and ready in the mini brute. Look at the elongated wheelbases of all of these trucks. And this is new in just the last couple of years. They've got so much power now that uh, at the stock wheelbase, they just point towards the dome of the after dome all the time. Oh, this is kind of an awkward pull, too. The track is rough, as uh, Mike Stowe said, and another bouncer is coming at us, and he's going to be a good deal short of the distance. Mark Miller, 263.85 feet. Now, they measure those distances with lasers set up here in the Astrodome, so they can report that in instantly. Now, Mark Miller at 263, not nearly close enough to move into contention and fight Ken Lamont, who is still the leader, at 282.9. We take a look at the run again. The problem for the first couple of guys has been not enough weight in the front. Here we have an example of a little too much weight. Look at the grill bounce back and forth. His front end is staying down on the ground, and that didn't help him either. At the finish, Mark Miller is climbing out. Well, Mark, I'm sorry to tell you that 263 feet is not going to take top money. And what a rough ride you had. Yeah, it's, it was a rough ride. The track is very rough, and for some reason my truck just isn't working on this track. Is the track so rough it can do damage to the machine, or is the machine sturdy enough to withstand it? Here in the Astrodome, they have two different pulling courses, one on either side of the stadium. Let's take a look at the leaderboard. The Midnight Express is currently the leader in this pull-off, followed by Roush Stowe, and that run just completed by Mark Miller. And Wayne Roush, who is currently in second, has a second truck, the Little Red Truck, and he's getting ready to pull again. We'll be back. This is the Bishop's Palace, the most famous architectural wonder in historic Galveston. It's owned by the Galveston Archdiocese now, but it was built as a private home in 1886 by Colonel Walter Gresham. On the floor of the Houston Astrodome, we're ready for Wayne Rouch's second pull. Now, this is an entirely different score. He was out earlier in his yellow truck. This is his little red truck. This will be a second pull. He made the pull off with both machines. So this gives him an opportunity to make it into the top place and take a shot at Kent Lamont's top position. Well, it'll be interesting to see, Paul, if he learned anything from his earlier pull. So far, he appears, and this is Jim Lyons looking on. He'll be next to Hook. Rouse does not appear to have the power or the balance and maybe a motor going away on the bit because there's some oily looking smoke blowing out of the bottom. Well, Wayne's pull is short. Paul, how does Jim Lyons feel about what he saw? Get you for just a minute. You've been watching him come down this track. What are you thinking? Can you beat him? Boy, I don't know. The track's awful rough, and it's, it's going to be hard to do unless I get off a good spot on the track and get a good hook. It's going to be hard to get down there because it's just getting so rough and jerking the driver so bad that it, it's terrible. From what you've been watching, is there a place you're going to guide for? We're going to try this side. It's probably a mistake, but I'm going to try it. All right, there he is, Steve. Well, Paul, rough is a four-letter word to tractor pullers because there is no suspension whatsoever for or aft in most of these vehicles. They are strictly solid, which is why when they get to bouncing like this, if the rear tires hit any kind of a rut, it's going to affect the entire truck. There's nothing there to absorb the shock. Look at the sheet metal and the fiberglass just rattling around there. These are real stiff things. That's something you'd want to drive down a bumpy country road. Well, Steve, Jim Lyons was very, very careful while he was watching Wayne Roush's pull. And he noticed that Roush used the left side of the course. And as we watch him back up, he is edged over to the right side. So apparently he thinks there's better pulling power over on the right side. Stitches is the machine, Jim Lyons the driver, as he backs up and makes his hook. 
Well, Paul, actually, Jim has got nothing to lose by trying uh, another side of the course. The track is hard all the way across. After every pull, they uh, zip in with some little uh, machines and try to repack all of the dirt. So it may not make any difference, but certainly at least he knows by watching Wayne Roush how rough it can be over there. Uh, Richard McPherson, again, the next puller, looking on, and he is really studying this pull by Jim Lyons. You know what he's watching? He's watching those rear tires and how smoothly, if smooth at all, they go down this course. Here comes the weight transfer box. McPherson's still looking on. This is a good pull. No, no, this is an excellent pull. Jim Lyons settles down the measurement. 289.9 feet. Jim Lyons is our new leader, the man from Louisville, Kentucky. Richard, we've just seen the lead change, and he pulled over to the right side of the track. What do you think? Uh, that's what we were kind of watching, to see if he could, this side would work, so we're going to try it, too. All right, good luck to you. Thank you. Well, it sounds like we're going to see McPherson in the same tracks of Jim Lyons. Well, now, Jim Lyons took a chance. He moved over to new territory on the right side of the track and then did an interesting thing as he drifted across to the left side of the track. Look at the front end. Absolutely perfect position. This is what a driver wants. Jim Lyons really planned this run well. Now, let's go down to the far end. Steve is with our new leader. Well, here you see why Jim Lyons is a defending champion in the class. What a brilliant pull. Straight and smooth. How did you do that? Well, I went to the far side. Uh, everybody run the left-hand side of the track. I went to the right-hand side. I see Dick McPherson's over there now, so he'll probably make a good run there, too. I made a super run and was really proud of it, but I was afraid I would go out of bounds. He was trying to go the other way. I was on the brake, but he come back. Well, the machine is the Missouri Raider. Richard McPherson is actually from Circleville, Ohio. As he backs up, the officials line him up to the sled, and he's ready to hook up. The benchmark is Jim Lyons now, just taking the lead at 289 feet. Interesting what uh, Jim just told me, Paul, that when he was drifting across the course, that was inadvertent. He was actually on the brake trying to straighten it out, but it sure worked for him. Let's see if uh, Richard McPherson doesn't do that on purpose. If you didn't know better, you would think you were looking at competition eliminator at an NHRA drag race, the classic hot rod style pulling truck, a 23T fiberglass replica body. Uh, just a beautiful machine, everything polished. And here looking on his Chuck Chipwood, he'll be the next up. All right, here goes Richard McPherson. Let's look at that beautiful polished chrome Chevrolet motor pulling that roadster and the sled down the course. He also, but this time I believe intentionally, drifts off to the left just a little bit but it does not quite match the number of Jim Lyons. 281.08 feet for Richard McPherson. Paul? Chuck Chetwood, he started off to the right, drifted across to the left. That seems to be the way to go, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Uh, this right side, nobody's been running it. And I was telling uh, Bubba there that we needed to get on this side right before Lyons ran. Lyons ran it, McPherson ran it, and you can believe we're going to run it over here. All right, it's your time in the bottle. Do her good. Thank you. So McPherson now at 281 feet. That's good enough for fourth for the moment. He moves Mike Stowe down to fifth place. Let's go down to the finish line. Steve is with Richard McPherson. What did you learn out there? You might pass on to another competitor. Uh, we were just watching Jim Lyons. We was wondering why nobody was using that side of the track. And uh, well, he we were thinking about trying it. So uh, Jim tried it. It worked. So we took a shot behind the winner. you got to watch these things closely, yeah. Right. It's very, you gotta, you got to keep your eyes on it. Thank you. So Richard McPherson moves into fourth position, and we've had some changes in the standings as we take a look at the leaderboard to the moment. Jim Lyons displaces Ken Lamont and goes into the lead, followed by Wayne Roush, and that run you just saw with McPherson, Mike Stowe down in fifth. Wayne Roush's second run gives him sixth place, and then Mark Miller. So we still have three more competitors in the pulling, but for the moment, the excitement begins to ripple through the Astrodome as we look out the front window of Bigfoot. The monster trucks are coming up next. In the late 1800s, the square rig sailing ship Elisa would call on the port of Galveston. The citizens bought her with $4 million refurbished her, and she stands as a floating museum now. But we're at the Astrodome for more modern transportation, the monster trucks. This is the master of disaster, ready to take on a very challenging course here in the Astrodome. Earlier, Steve Evans took a look at parts of it. Seems a bit odd to find a gasoline generator on about the 30-yard line of the Astrodome. 
but that's the only way they could get power to the new monster truck starting system. Pretty slick, huh? When we were here a year ago, monster truck racing was really brand new, and they were kind of flying blind as far as rules and regulations were concerned. Well, they got it pretty well organized now. As each truck approaches a set of cars, they must hit that first car with both front wheels, or they're disqualified. Now, as they travel down the cars, it's okay to slide off one side or the other if that's what happens, but you've got to exit the row of cars with at least two wheels still making contact with the metal. Also, now, there's a center line right here. Cross that center line and you're out of competition, much like drag racing. And see the orange cones on either side of the big jump down there? If you knock one of those over, you're also out of competition. Now, a close race can be as hard to call as a horse race, because one truck may be up in the air and the other down. So, here's the finish line, and up there in the Astrodome is a video camera locked down right here. So they've got an instant replay if they need it. You know, and I was thinking earlier, boy, if these cars could talk, I'll bet they could tell some stories as to how they ended up in this predicament, especially this one with the four very prominent bullet holes. Steve, you want to get away from the back of my car? All right, Bigfoot on the line, ready to go. Now, remember, you saw him earlier get to this round by eliminating Bennett Clark and Clydesdale. The flagman, Billy Joe Miles, checks with the driver, Rich Hooser of St. Louis, Missouri. He will face Doug Spanier from Albany, Minnesota, who is the driver of Master of Disaster. And you know, Paul, American sporting crowds are legendary for always rooting for the underdog. But in monster truck racing, they continue to ride with the truck way over in the far lane, the blue machine called Bigfoot. Because Bob Chandler and his drivers and the various trucks really conceived this sport, and they're still on top of it. They have more power than anyone else. That's a supercharged 460 cubic inch motor in Bigfoot. And Rich Hooser gets the early lady and the whole shot, and you're riding with him as they go. Oh, and look at the air from Bigfoot. A perfect landing for Bigfoot, not so for Master of Disaster. A bit front end heavy. And here is the trickiest part of this course, making that turn with the four-wheel steering. Bigfoot with an incredible lead. Unless Rich makes a fatal error here or slides off the cars, he's going to win this one easily. It is Bigfoot going to the next round. Absolutely no problem at all for Bigfoot as he turns off the course master of disaster well problems there not only did he not win the machine is not running exactly right here is master of disaster on the jump now take a look as he comes down he noses down hard may have actually broke something when he made that landing so well, that could have cost him the race right there though the machine rolls on you can see the wheels seem to be slightly askew at the same time looking at it from another angle there is bigfoot now this is perfection in flight settles down nice and even on all four takes a little bounce a perfect four point landing right on the numbers perfect it was and here is our next pair in monster truck competition this is the chevrolet truck called warrior out of Corpus Christi, Texas, and they'll be up against over in the far lane the just showing off truck out of Woodland, Texas, and that's a Ford, so it'll be Chevrolet versus Ford. Now the Chevrolet truck called Warrior, the brown machine right there, is driven by this man, relatively new to monster truck racing, Lupe Sosa. Now he'll be racing against this man, Paul Huffaker, in the just showing off truck, Woodland, Texas, and we got a pair of Texas at Ford versus Chevy. Now, Huffaker, early in round one, was paired up with King Crunch, driven by Scott Stevens, and something, uh, well, rather interesting happened. Interesting to us, not so interesting to the TNT people. As watch the centerline light system here, the one we talked about and touted so highly earlier, say goodnight to it. Well, after the incident, Paul talked to a rather uh, embarrassed Scott Stevens. Well, Steve, here is Scott Stevens as he climbs down out of King Crunch. You were going fine, and you made a mess of everything. Yes, it's kind of a new thing we were trying to... It probably worked real good on the short indoor tracks, but when you're here in the Astrodome, it's, it's like a real big track. And the rear steering, we don't have front steering, just the rear. And uh, kind of got a little crooked on the last set of cars. And everything happened a little too quick, and I hit the cars pretty hard. Are you reasonably certain now that it doesn't work? On the big tracks, it don't work, but, uh, you know, we might have to do some changes. and It might work possibly in, on a shorter track. On the long track, it don't work. All right, well, we're glad you're okay. Thanks, Scott. Don't worry about it, Scott. Who needs those fancy electronic starting systems, right, Paul? We'll just go back to a good old flag. Like the days when you started drag racing, 1930, 1931. Warrior and just showing off. There's just showing off. Paul Huffaker at the wheel raises his hand. He's ready to go. Black man checks with both of them. 
Hey, it's a good start. No one had an advantage right off of the mark, and they're still pretty close together. Now, this will be the test of man and machine. Tremendous error from just showing up. Warrior hanging right in there. Now, the turn, as we've seen before, is crucial. Now, there you see why you want four-wheel steering. Just showing up, executes a perfect turn. Four-wheel steering also with the Warrior truck, but just uh, seemed to be a little intimidated by that turn. And now with a good lead, just showing off, kind of cruises over those cars that are getting flatter and flatter. Well, the rule is really the same in any form of motorsports. You have to be smooth. You have to take this monstrous power and bring it under control. And it looks like a problem there with Warrior as well, as we see a belt of smoke coming out of the engine now. I'd say its day is done. Its race certainly is, as Steve Puppeter is the winner. Well, looking once again, you can see in the far lane, just showing off, took this first jump far better than did Warrior. And even though he got a lot of air, he was still up accelerating somehow through the air. Got the rear wheels down first to drive off a well-balanced truck, much like Bigfoot. And obviously, also, just showing off has a pretty good advantage when it comes to horsepower. Well, Paul has grabbed his ladder and has scampered up to talk to Paul Huffaker. Paul? Well, a great way to do an interview on the ladder. Nice little run there. Ah, uh, thank you. How's the track? Uh, it's, those jumps are rough. They're really throwing you high in the air. It's beating you to death. What do you got to think about going to the next round? Uh, who I'm up against, I believe. I have no idea who it is yet, but the truck's working okay, and the track's getting better. All right, good luck to you. All right, thank Take you. Care. Well, Paul, you can tell young Mr. Huffaker we got some good news and some bad news. He's still in competition, but he meets Bigfoot in the very next round, and that is always something to worry about. We'll have more two-wheel truck pulling right after this. One of the favorite attractions in Galveston, Texas, is Seawolf Park. Now, that's the destroyer escort USS Stewart, set up on the land now so that you can come visit. A Korean War vintage saber jet and an old diesel power submarine that combed the Pacific, the Gulf of Mexico, and the Atlantic years and years ago. But we're interested in alcohol-powered machines now at the TNT Redman All-American from the Houston Astrodome. And, Paul, we continue with the pull-off among the two-wheel drive trucks. There you can see all the suitcase weights that have been attached to the machine of Chuck Chipwood. He is the next to hook. In fact, there is the hook going in the eye on the machine. The oil pressure up about 45 pounds, right where it ought to be. And the mark he has to beat was put down by Jim Lyon, 289.9 feet. Now, you see his feet? That's how you steer these machines. You might as well take that steering wheel and give it away to somebody in the crowd as a souvenir. Because if the truck is balanced properly, the front wheels are never on the dirt long enough to act as a steering device. But you try to use those brakes very sparingly because they cost your wheel speed. And looking on is the next puller, and that is Richard Wisnett. Here is Chipwood. The sled is starting to slide off to the right-hand side. He's steering away from it. But let's see that right front wheel may have come down over the line. He's okay with the rear wheel, but the fast-forward truck, yes, he has been disqualified. Well, it looks like Jim Lyons, 289.94, is the number to beat. What do you think? Well, he made a real good run. Uh, I just hope mine stays together. I can get a good straight run down. Maybe I can get it. You've been looking at that course. You got any idea where you want to run? Yeah, I'm going to run about the same spot Jim run in. Start out on the right and drift across a little. Well, no, I'm going to try to hold it straight on the right side. All right, good luck to you. Thank you. Well, Paul, if he does that, he may suffer the same fortune as Chuck Chipwood did because it appears that if you're lined up there, it's going to slide you off to the right. A very concerned Chuck Chipwood climbs out of his machine. He wants to see what the officials are talking about. As we take a look at Chipwood's run, actually the front end is just running a touch high. He's got a fairly good run going, gets it down, gets it balanced, but it begins to drift over to his right. You can see that white line coming into view, and you can see he's anticipating it. He's got the wheels turned back to the left, hoping that if it comes down and bites, it may pull him away. That kind of luck was not to be his as it landed with its right front tire right on the white line. Now he's with Steve. Well, Paul, as you pointed out, the right front wheel of Chuck's truck is over the outside line and apparently have been disqualified on the, in the pull-off. Yeah, that's what they say. Uh, if you go out of bounds, you're disqualified. Uh, they, they put a rule in this year, if you hit in and bounce out, then you're, you're not disqualified. I knew I was close. Uh, you know, that's just racing. I'm not, you know, I'm not bitter about it. I hate it. It's uh, it's one of those things, you know. I, 
I was trying to ride this right-hand line. The track's so tore up over there, and I just got too close. Hey, if you didn't hate it, you wouldn't be the champion you are. Thanks a lot. Thank you. You spend all that time, all that preparation, only to be disqualified for a couple of inches over the line. Still, that's the rule. You know, Paul, as high as that front end was, I'm sure he had no idea whether he had hit in and bounced out or had landed out. But the officials were watching very carefully. The TNT guys do, do a terrific job of uh, keeping law and order among the pullers. Here is Richard Wisnett. Now, you heard him tell Paul that he was going to try to take just about the same line as did Chuck Chipwood. Let's hope the same fate does not be falling. Scott Baker was scheduled for this pull-off, but he is a scratch. So Richard Wisnett is going to be the last puller as he powers up and heads down the course. Jim Lyons is watching to see if he can hold the lead. Wisnett drifts over to the edge of the line. He's got his wheels on the line. That's a disqualification. Jim Lyons will win it. He tried the right-hand side. That was the side that paid off for everybody, but he got just a little close to that line. Richard Wisnett is disqualified. Jim Lyons is our winner. Well, this is the man that will take home the lion's share of the purse and the two-wheel drive pullers. Jim Lyons, a great job. You took a chance to win it, though. You gambled. Yeah, uh, I really did. My truck always goes to the right-hand side of the track, and I wanted to go to the right bad. That's the only place left when I pull. That was a good shot. And I said, I'm going to gamble and go with it. Now, the last boy that run there, he gambled and run out of bounds and lost a bunch of ground on the points. It's kind of like a golfer playing his natural hook or slice to his advantage. Yes, it is, Steve. It sure is. Okay, congratulations. Thank you very much. You bet. So Jim Lyons, with a magnificent pull, 289.94 feet, is our winner. Ken Lamont, the early leader, moved into second place, followed by Wayne Roush, McPherson, Stowe. Roush's second run, Mark Miller, Chitwood and Wiston were both disqualified when they drifted across the line on their right side of the course. Now it's time for the Dragster Tractor. 7,200 pounds. Paul Norman in the war wagon, pulling up, and he's ready to hook. But I think Steve Evans has a problem he needs some help with. You know those close-up looks at things that we like to do in our shows? Our director calls those pieces. He'll say, Evans, go get me some pieces. Make me care about these people and these machines. Well, we've been doing tractor pulling now for, what, six years? I'm fresh out of pieces, okay? I mean, how many times can I tell you that the brakes are more important than the steering wheel when it comes to controlling one of these things? Because the wheels are usually off the ground, the front wheels, and they do a dance on the independent rear brakes to try to keep the tractor going straight. I mean, dozens of times I've told you that these supercharged alcohol-burning engines create over a 1,000 horsepower. This is Paul Norman's war wagon. He's got three big Hemi Arises. You'll find four engines, as many as six engines. And I've told you before that weight is the big deal in pulling maximum weight. Weight here is an advantage and they're constantly moving these big suitcase weights from front to back trying to find just the right balance where it'll carry the front wheels off a foot or so off the ground for maximum weight transfer i mean how many times can we talk about the safety on these tractors all of these engines have an emergency kill switch there at the back that's hooked up to the sled and should it break loose it uh, shuts down all of the engines i mean we've done these things over and over to it if you've got any idea call me at 1-800 pieces well, Steve, you can bet that weight has been added and the gearing changed for this class of multi-engine monsters. We're talking real big, raw horsepower here. <laughs> and for that very reason, the pulling distance initially is 300 feet. Earlier, Paul, when I sat up on top of the war wagon, I mean, the feeling of power you get up there without even the engines running, it's, it's just incredible to look out over those three areas. I mean, oh, I mean, it's, you think these things only go 25 or 30 miles an hour, but it's the power that makes them special. Look at those. It's like an engine showroom up front there. And Paul Norman, he's taking up the slack. Now, this is his first run. It's also the first run of the class, so he'll have an option whether or not to take this distance or not. Paul Norman, it's a pretty good pull. He gets the front end balance just about right where he wants it and grinds to a stop. Paul Norman, 267 and a quarter feet. 267 and a quarter. So now he has to stop and think. 267, the course is 300. Will there be a pull-off? What should I do? Will I take this run or move on? Let's go back and take a look at Paul Norman's run. Well, it sure was a pretty pull, Paul. It remains to be seen uh, whether the war wagon takes this or elects to drop back in line. 
but uh, only Paul Norman knows the potential of his tractor and the feeling he got in the seat of his pants whether he could pull it any further if he had another opportunity. Awfully nice. 267 and a quarter feet, and Paul Norman says that's plenty good enough. I'm going to take that run. So that brings up this man, Steve Boning, and the orange truck. Look at the motors on that thing. We're talking horsepower in this class. Three different engines up front. At the far end, now Steve is with Paul Norman. Well, Paul, it looked to be balanced just about right, uh, but still not quite out the back door. Yeah, I was pleased with the run. The all pro auto parts war wagon hooked into the track good. It ran well. I, I was pleased with the pull. I went ahead and took it. Nothing you'd change if you could do it again? I don't believe so. Everything looked real good. The orange crush. Steve Boning backs up, makes the hook. He's in position now, ready for his run. The benchmark, 267 and a quarter feet. Paul Norman just ran that distance. Look at the tires, Paul. They used to use the big ribs, as they do on a tractor up out in the wheat field. But no longer. They have gone to almost slick tires to try to get more rubber to dirt contact. The Orange Crush, Paul, like most of the tractors anymore in these modified classes, is a custom-built machine. The frame, they put a roll cage on it. You can see it casing it much like you would in a, a straightaway track racing type machine. And we're looking down the throat of three fuel injectors, each bolted to a centrifugal root style blower on hemispherical racing hemis. Boy, I'll tell you what a machine this would be just to change the spark plugs in. Now he's got a decent pull going. Well, he had one going. The wheels are spinning, but the track is really not going anywhere. And the box on the decision maker sled, that's what they call it, stops him in his track way short at 238.3 feet. Steve Boney's going to be disappointed with that run. And in fact, you can see the disappointment on his face. He just sits kind of stoically in the cockpit now. It, it really stopped very early for him. As you can watch the replay, you see the wheels start to spin. Now, they're not getting the kind of traction that he wants at this point. And even though it's pulling and it's laying down a lot of power to the rear wheels, that power is not hooking up with the dirt. When that happens, then there is no pull. Let's go down to the far end. Steve Evans is with Steve Boney. Well, Steve, 238 feet, I don't believe is going to make your day. No, not quite. <laughs> a little down on power, balance what? Uh, probably down on balance. What would you do to change it? Get it a little less nose heavy? Or? A little less nose heavy and a little less air pressure in the tires. Really? Tell me about the air pressure. What do you run? Uh, right now, I'm running about six pounds. What would you lower them down to? Probably about five. Try to get more grip? Yeah, I'll just hold. Thanks a lot. Currently in a very tentative second place. Well, on the line, Southern Storm from the metropolis of Goose Creek, South Carolina. The monster trucks are coming up. Floating majestically off the calm seas of Galveston is one of the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company's airships. Some years ago, Paul Page, I had a chance to ride in one of the blimps. And the first time the pilot points it down at the ground, you forget for an instant that it's lighter than air. Even worse when they shut the engines off while you're drifting up there. But the engines are on, fired up, and ready to go. Monster trucks on the line. Southern Storm and Carolina Crusher. Now, the winner of this round will go on to the semifinals. There is the Southern Storm, a particularly unique machine. And Steve Evans earlier took a look at it. You're looking at America's only twin-engine flip-top monster truck. This is Robbie Giles' Southern Storm. Now, up front in the standard locations, it's a Ford 429 interceptor engine running through a stock C6 automatic transmission and a standard Ford transfer case, just like you'd have in an 88 Ranger 4x4. Now, at the rear of the vehicle, things get interesting. Another 429 interceptor motor, same kind of transmissions. Now, amidship the truck is a special two-and-a-half-ton Army truck transfer case. It's air shifted, and it is what makes all of this possible. Both engines feed into that transfer case, and out of the bottom of it come drive shafts to the front and rear differential. Now, Robbie, through uh, a matter of shifting this thing, can have the front motor drive the rear wheels or the front wheels only. He can have the rear engine do that. He can have both engines powering all four wheels, any combination of the above. Now, uh, normally, 90% of the time, he only uses that front engine. But when competition gets tough, as it will in the Astrodome, he can fire up that rear motor and double his power. And the driver on board, 
is from Goose Creek, South Carolina. He is Robbie Giles driving that Ford. And he faces Wadesboro, North Carolina's Gary Porter in the Carolina Crusher. And you can see that is a Chevrolet, and he lays the challenge down. Oh, indeed he does. I guarantee you they're running both engines in the other lane in that Ford driven by Mr. Giles. Look at this, a good start by the twin-engine truck in the far lane. How, oh, and all of a sudden, making up the differential is the Carolina Crusher. Here is that all-important pirouette they have to make, and who makes it better? It appears to be the Carolina Crusher. And slowing there for a moment is Giles in the twin-engine board. Looks like a big lead now for the Crusher. The Carolina Crusher makes the jump and finishes it as Giles bounces over the finish line as well. The Carolina Crusher will move into the semi-final round. And once again, it's the turn at the far end that really is the pivotal part of this course. As we take a look once again, Carolina Crusher was actually behind as they came to the first jump. He sure was, Paul, but uh, over the cars, or what's left of the cars, uh, he made up that ground. Now, on the return trip, Southern Storm tried to make up the lost ground with a magnificent leap. Look at this, a beautiful view of the undercarriage of that Ford truck. But it wasn't quite enough. And in fact, he darn near completely lost control as he came off the last of the cars. Paul's with the driver of the winning truck. Uh, Steve, here's Gary Porter. Gary, good little run there. Did you know Robbie almost got you? Yes, I knew it was very close. I just had to stay into it. And it was a very close race. Right at the end there, he came right up behind you. Did you hunker down? you think he might have hit you? Uh, he might have, but it's very doubtful. You know, all the trucks have good brakes, and he's a good driver. Okay, good run. What do you expect out of the next round? Well, I hope to win, but uh, I don't know who I'll be up against yet. We'll just have to wait and see. All right, good luck. Thank you. Well, Paul, you can tell Gary that no one yet knows who he's going to be up against in the semifinals. That will be determined in just a moment or two. He'll either, either race the Barbarian, the Ford truck, the bright orange machine we're looking at there, or he'll race the Clydesdale in the opposite lane, the Chevrolet truck. One of these will go to the semifinals to face off with Gary Porter. Clydesdale backs up to the line, driven by Bennett Clark of Canton, Georgia, in the Chevrolet, and he faces the Ford driver, Barbarian Jim Miller from Nokomis, Illinois. Now, Miller, in the first round, went up against Gail Medford in Stomper. Now, Gail Medford, Paul, is a very experienced monster truck racer. But up against the Barbarian, well, he had a problem or two. Let's, let's take a look. Now, this was earlier today here in the Astrodome. Now, that's the Chevy truck stopper in the near lane. He's the one to watch. He had a nice lead over the Barbarian. Barbarian kind of struggling a bit. But suddenly, and now you're riding on board with Stopper. You can see the flames coming out of the top. Gail Mefford made the turn, headed down, and suddenly swapped lanes. Now he's on the wrong side of the track, and he crushes the wrong set of cars. Now, only Gail Mefford could tell us whether that was accidental, on purpose, or what did happen. Well, I'll tell you what, it looked great. Everything seemed like it went right just in the wrong place, huh? Well, uh, I didn't know where I was at until my partner told me I was in the other lane. What happened then? I understand he walked up to you and you just pulled the visor down. Yeah, my visor come down when it hit the uh, first set of cars, and it was steamed up, and I didn't know where I was at. <laughs> so you just lost out there? I just lost it. No, this is not that big a place. No, it's not. <laughs> yep, I should have kept it under control, shouldn't I? <laughs> That's a whale of a way to get pushed out, isn't it? Sure is. All right, we'll see. If you're going to get disqualified, you might as well do it right. All right, we'll see you again in the future. Okay, thank you. thank you. Gail Mefford, he'll take a little ribbon about that for a while. All right, here is the Barbarian who benefited from uh, Mefford getting lost on the floor of the Astrodome. And he, if he wins this, will go to the semifinal round. If he doesn't, he'll go home. We got a good start, Paul. On the near side is Bennett Clark and Clydesdale, but Barbarian gets to the cars first. They're running almost even coming off the cars, but look now at Barbarian takes a much wider turn. Bennett Clark tucks it in, comes over the mogul. Well, you know, I thought Bennett Clark made the wise decision there. Uh, the Barbarian driver figured he'd try to carry more speed by making the wide turn. But boy, Bennett Clark turned everything into his favor, and he will go into the semifinal round. A little driving lesson for the fellow in the Barbarian truck. So Barbarian slows down, comes in second place. He is eliminated, and Bennett Clark in the Clydesdale will face Carolina Crusher in the semifinal round. Bigfoot will face just showing off. But Bennett Clark may have more than he bargained for. Take a look at this. 
as Clark takes a look up underneath his chassis. He's got some broken shock absorbers. They're going to have to come off. Look at that thing dangling down there. Well, some of these monster trucks, Paul, have as many as 50 shock absorbers on them. No shocks on the 7,200-pound modified dragster tractors, though. We'll be seeing this man, John Carlton Hook, when we come back. Well, I don't know about you, but when I do my pulling, I may use big horsepower, like this magnificent steam locomotive from the Railroad Museum in Galveston, Texas. It's the largest collection of restored rail cars and locomotives in the southwestern United States. We're at the Houston Astrodome as Ron Hickson sits up on the sled, makes sure that everything is right, and John Carlton is backing up, ready to hook up in the TNT Redman All-American. John Carlton has been around since the infancy of this sport, Paul, and all of his tractors have been called the Virginia Farmer. He's out pulling in the country so much these days, I wonder if he has time to do much farming anymore. Now, these are big block Chevrolet-style engines, each fitted with a supercharger and fuel injection, alcohol in the tank, and you can hear all three of them just kind of idling right now. But once it gets on the power, this tractor will literally shake the floor in the Astrodome, won't it, Paul? Absolutely. Those Rodec engines really make the power as he's ready to go. Look at the rear tires spin up there as he lays the power to it. John Carlton shooting for Paul Norman's mark of 267 and a quarter feet. But it begins to grind to a stop very early on, not nearly far enough. 216.94 feet for John Carlton. Paul, it appeared that he just wasn't getting any traction. We talked before how they have ground these tires off to where they're virtually slick. I really wonder on a track this hard, if maybe you wouldn't need a little more of a paddle on the tire, a little more tread on the tire to try to get some kind of grip. I'm just theorizing here, but uh, you be the judge at home. Watch those rear tires and look how they're spinning. The tractor's not moving forward at more than about 15 to 20 miles an hour. The rear tires are probably turning 100 miles per hour. A lot of energy going out into the air there. We've had three pulls now. The only one that really matters is Paul Norman. He's the leader at 267 and a quarter. Well, John Carlton gives it hard right rudder, but uh, that doesn't help a bit. The big old sled just stopped him cold in his track, and here is the next man to hook. Another one of these just awesome machines, Paul. It's the mean mistreater. This is Fred Freeman, fellow Hoosier, lives not far from me, in Wadesville, Indiana, as he backs up, ready to hook up. And he backs up very carefully, too, Paul, for one thing, being uh, very cautious of the operators that move in and around the sled. And also, he wants to get that tractor right squarely lined up with the sled so that when he hooks up and he takes the slack out of the chain, everything is parallel. That hookup is currently being made. I'll tell you, they use a mighty stout chain to hook up to a 7,200-pound tractor to drag a 60,000-pound sled, approximately. Now, look at the motor configuration in this tractor. There are four engines, two in line and one coming in from either direction. And that's made possible by a special gearbox made by a guy named Tim Engler, who we'll see later in his own tractor in this class. Now, take a look at the speed at which the weight transfer box is moving up those rails in comparison to the speed of the tractor, because they are relative. Oh, this is a pretty nice pull ball. Fred Freeman grinds it to a stop, shuts the power down. Pretty good little pull, 200. 61 feet, and that will move Fred Freeman into second place. That's right, he has to settle for second for want of just about six feet. That still leaves Paul Norman on top of our leaderboard. And look at the safety that the tractor drivers have gone to, Paul. They're wearing fireproof suits and good helmets and uh, all the things that you'd expect in a professional motorsport. It wasn't always that way. Here's Tim Engler, another Hoosier from Princeton, Indiana. The machine is mission impossible as he is ready to go after Paul Norman's leading distance of 267 and a quarter feet. And look, once again, we got engines plugged in from every direction on this thing. Let's go to the finish line. Steve Evans is with Fred Freeman. Well, Fred, 261 feet will be good enough for second place right now. Well, uh, I'll have to be pretty satisfied with that run because the track's really hard and uh, couldn't really get no lift on my tractor. And most people that see me run, they know that my tractor likes to lift in the front end for me to do any good. But the guy has to make do with the best he's got. Okay, thank you, Fred. And here is Tim Engler. Mission Impossible, just about the biggest name in Dragster tractor pulling these days. 
You know, earlier, Paul had a good look at this particular tractor and found out what kind of commitment it takes to run one of these machines. It truly is very hard work. You know, when this sport began about a quarter of a century ago, it was the kind of thing run at county fairs. You just got your tractor off the farm, brought her over, and competed. Well, as with all motorsports, as it increased, the technology went right through the ceiling. This is Mission Impossible. It belongs to Tim and Tammy Engler. It's one of the top competitors in the sport. And as you can see, sophisticated motors, not just one. One, two, three, four. So now, maintenance goes through the ceiling as well. Everybody works on the machine, works at it as a full-time occupation now. And as a matter of fact, if you want to just do the valve clearances, change the oil and filters, well, it takes the entire day. <laughs> Add spark plugs to that list, and you're up till midnight. Well, here is Tim Engler, hoping that that fine crew of his has got the tractor in good stead. As I said before, this man has won a lot. He's, he's really the big name right now, Paul. This is the guy to beat any time he pulls in any class. And he's got a great pull going. The front end is just perfectly balanced. That's how you do it. Tim Engler, can he beat the mark laid down by Paul Norman? He has done so. Boy, it's got so much horsepower, it almost threw him out of the seat. It's exactly what you want to see. He got the momentum going early. He got that thing really up running, and he got so much weight flowing forward that it just carried him right on down the course, and at 269.57 feet, he moves into first place. So here is Tim Igler. He is now our leader, while Norman moves back into second. And look at it bounce when it rolls to a stop. It literally picks him up and tosses him in the air. You know, the tractor was trying to go left on you. Were you on that opposite brake? Well, we were, but I didn't want to get the one wheel. This tractor has a real problem trying to get one wheel up. So we were just trying to feather the brake enough to try to keep it to where it didn't get real crooked. But the way the track is, it's so hard, it's really hard to get the tires into the track with a higher power tractor. So. We feel real lucky to get the, the where we did right now. So in the 7,200-pound dragster tractors, Tim Engler now moves into first place, displacing Paul Norman. Freeman is third, Boning is fourth, and John Carlton is in fifth place. But there is still more to come. And more monster trucks coming up. It's the semi-final round as Bigfoot comes to the line. From the rigging of the Elisa to a modern merchant ship, the Sea Music. For three centuries, the Galveston Harbor has served all types of shipping. For over 20 years, the Astrodome in nearby Houston has served all forms of sport. But this one makes more noise, and to many of the fans, it's more fun than anything else they've ever seen. Much good truck racing. And this is Bigfoot next up with just showing off. We're in the semifinal. Look at the leap from Rich Hooser at Bigfoot. Rich leans out that left side window, takes a look down. That's how he decides where he's going, not by looking out over the front. But just showing off, came around the corner ahead of Bigfoot. Now Bigfoot with an amazing burst of power, a fantastic jump, and Bigfoot wins it. Just showing off, almost goes upside down. Look at Paul Huffaker bouncing around inside the cab. I'll tell you what, he put a little bit of fear into Rich Hooser that time before they made the turn at the far end. Just showing off, had the lead. Let's take one more look. This is Bigfoot. I'm going to tell you, Steve Evans, this was a race. Bigfoot was up in the air first ahead of just showing off as they came to the first set of cars. And then when they got down to the far end and made the turn, just showing off took the lead. But then Bigfoot laid on the power. Here is just showing off as he's coming to the finish line. And he noses down and almost augers her in. Look at the bounce that he takes on that one. Almost rolls it up over and backwards. Well, I tell you, these cars have received some tremendous punishment. And Steve Evans continues his fascination with them. Paul, well, take a look close up at what these monster trucks have reduced 40 automobiles to. They are just trash. You know, I've been prancing up and down on them and having a pretty good time, but not now. There's too much jagged metal and sharp objects. It's a wonder they don't puncture the tires on the trucks as soon as they touch them. Now, these cars were scheduled to go to the crusher, like all junk cars do. I think that's pretty well been accomplished. 
And one man who has truly been part of the carnage on those poor old vehicles is Rich Hooser, who's with Paul. Rich, are you okay? Yeah, everything's good. Everything look all right? Yeah. That was a close one. Yeah, it was. I see he had me on that corner. I kind of, when I hit that last bump, my hand got away from my rear steering. I couldn't get it. And so when I finally got it, I seen he was making that turn before I was, so I had to play catch up and just keep my foot in it. Well, you just nailed it. I think that's as high as I've seen her ever. Yeah, well, it, was a, it was a fun ride, I'll tell you that. I'll say. I think Houston Hobby Airport got it on their air traffic radar. Who is going to face Bigfoot in the final? Will it be Clydesdale over there in the far lane, the blue and silver truck? Or will it be in the near lane, the Carolina Crusher? Bennett Clark drives Clydesdale. Gary Porter is in the Carolina Crusher. And from what we've seen earlier, from both of these trucks, Paul, this looks to be a pretty even match. Yeah, this should be a whale of a race. Both of them are in position now. They're, they're very even machines. Both guys really know how to drive these. They're well-prepared, they're well-powered, and they are off and running. The Crusher goes into the lead at first. Gary Porter up on the first jump. Nice even. Look at the control he has as he gets a little turn out to the left. I think that's a planned turn. As they come to the turn at the far end, it's Clydesdale. But Bennett Clark gets it a little askew. He's got it pointing the wrong direction. And now Clark falls behind the Carolina Crusher. Goes into the lead. And Gary Porter wins it and goes into the final round. I'll tell you what, Paul. Bennett Clark may have had that one in the bag. But this four-wheel steering we've talked about. You heard Rich Hooser even say that he couldn't get his hand on his steering. Well, that kind of got that truck of his dog tracking a bit. Let's, let's take another look here. Uh, the Carolina Crusher has the lead. Here comes Bennett Clark going to try to make up for it on this very last jump once he got the truck all straightened out. But it was not to be. Whoa, what a pounding these guys taking the wheel of these monster trucks. Well, thanks to some very consistent driving on the part of Gary Porter, the final round will feature the Carolina Crusher versus the always awesome Bigfoot. Well, right now, let's find out how Gary Porter feels about all of this. Gary, it's against Bigfoot, the final round. What do you think? What are you going to have to do to beat him? Well, I'm going to have to just keep it wide open and hope for the best. You've had a chance now to run this course a couple times. Any tricks to it? Well, it's a real tough course, and uh, I think the left lane's a little better. You got the biggest challenge there is. Good luck to you. Thank you. All righty. Hey, that should be just an outstanding final round of monster truck competition. Bigfoot and the Carolina Crusher. While they're getting ready, though, we've got some more dragster tractor action. This is Bill Patterson. He'll be our next puller. Can he better 269 feet to take first prize? We'll find out when we come back to the Houston Astrodome. So you have your chateau in France and your condo in Maui and a few million extra laying around. Well, how about one of these magnificent homes in Galveston? There are some real beauties down there. We are at the Houston Astrodome for the TNT Redman All-American. And Bill Patterson in his dragster tractor is pulling back the hook. The mark that he is shooting for is Tim Engler's 269 and a half feet. Well, here's a puller who came a long way to compete, Paul, from Sheffield, New York. The tractor is called the Sassy Massey after a Massey Ferguson, a tractor that uh, every farmer is familiar with. I don't think there's a lot of Massey Ferguson parts left on it by this time. Now, do you, Paul? Might be a nutter bolt down in the front end is all. Sassy Massey, Bill Patterson, he has a long way to pull. Now, you see, these engines, a little bit different configuration than Tim Engler. They're just kind of in line, two on one side and two on the other. The driver at least has a decent vision with this particular kind of an arrangement. And they get the motors way out there on the front end so that they serve as the necessary weight and balance. You know, the tractor doesn't know, Paul, that it has four motors in it. It thinks it has one great big 32-cylinder engine, and it's making some power. This is a nice pull by Phil Patterson. The front end may be a bit heavy. He'd like it to float up some. Let's see, is it close? Yeah, it's close. 262 feet. Not close enough to go into first place, but still a pretty good run. He's missed first place by seven feet as we take a look at Bill Patterson once again. Now watch the front end here because that's the key. Before the run, Bill watched what was going on on those that ran before him and decided how much weight he was going to put in the front end. Well, he's misjudged slightly because that front end is staying pinned on the ground, so it's not transferring weight like it should to the rear wheels. Nevertheless, it's a pretty good showing for this machine. And Bill Patterson moves into third with a pull of 262.2 feet. 
Now, this is David Boney, the Thunder and Lightning Machine. It's an Allison aircraft engine that's sitting up there in the front, and he is ready to pour on the power. Let's go to Steve. You gave it a heck of a try. Well, we tried. Uh, we're working awful hard at it. Um, just want, uh, you know, sometimes we're there. Sometimes the dog gets us, we get the dog. It's one way or the other. All right, thanks a lot. Good attitude. Bill Patterson currently third. As David Boning backs up, 12 cylinders of Allison aircraft engine just roaring with horsepower. As much as I love these old engines, Paul, of course, World War II vintage of fighter motors, I really wonder if they're competitive in this class. We've seen three engines and four engines. Now, there's some lighter classes in tractor pulling where there's still a big factor. I think David Boning is in here tough. You know, it's a tribute to the designers at Allison, though, that now, maybe 45, almost 50 years after they first took a pencil to the paper to design this engine, that it still has a purpose. It still performs. And perhaps even more important, that you can still find parts for the thing. Well, that's getting harder and harder to do. Uh, okay, the pull is off, and it did not have an illustrious start. The tractor did not launch very other. Now, it is pulling to the left. It's not just pulling to the left. It seems to have a mind of its own. And that is going to stop. David Boning, he will have the shortest pull we've seen in the class thus far. 181.89 feet, so not a spectacular run for David. If we take a look at him as he comes off the line. He's balanced in the front. Everything appears right. I think it's just simply a lack of motor, and then suddenly it starts going off the course. He gets on the brakes. When you get on the brakes, that, of course, slows everything down. He tries to straighten it out but it just doesn't happen. 181.8 feet. I know he's going to be disappointed with that. Coming up next, Pat Friels, the Kentuckian driving the Dollar Devil. These machines do eat an awful lot of money. Now, Friels will be the last puller. He's shooting for the mark set by Tim Engler, and this is one of Engler's old machines. Let's go to the finish and see. Well, David, it got away from you early, and you never were really able to gather it up. Yeah, I was a little light on the front. Well, it made a hard move to the left. I, I know you didn't want to foul over the line, but once you get off the throttle, it was a done deal. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't nothing I could do. It just go where I want to. Are you making enough power with the old aircraft engines? Do what now? You're making enough power with the old aircraft engines, and you can oh, it's, it's not like the three engines we ain't putting out, but about 2,000. Only 2,000. Yeah, that's about it. The rest of them putting out about five. And it's got to pull this kind of weight. This is the last pull in the Dragster Tractor 7,200-pound class. And you know the risk you take, uh, Tim Engler I'm speaking about, when you sell your old machine or build a duplicate of the one you have, uh, is that maybe that customer is going to pick your pocket for the purse. Well, Tim Engler's mark is what we're shooting at. As hands in the air, that's a rule, so everybody knows that he's not going to suddenly lurch forward and take off a couple of fingers or run over somebody. Safety always a primary concern in any form of motorsport, and especially here in the Astrodome tonight. The Dollar Devil. This is the last opportunity for anybody to beat out Tim Engler. Engler walking carefully from the sidelines. And here comes the power, and the pull is underway. If that front end doesn't come up, he doesn't have a prayer ball. Well, the start wasn't very spectacular. He just didn't really get the kind of momentum he needed, and he grinds to a stop, and he is going to come up short. Reels at 238.83 feet. That is good enough for fifth place. Let's go to the finish, and Steve. Well, Tim, it doesn't look like Pat has enough. In fact, I'm sure of it. Well, that's true. Uh, Pat's not got quite as much tire speed as we had on that run, but... He's been having a little time. He doesn't have quite enough high enough gear for the horsepower he's got, so we were just lucky tonight to come out of this, especially with a tractor jumping out of gear like it did, so we're real tickled with it. You mentioned that's the last time, the last pull for those four engines. You built brand new motors now? No, we're actually building a whole new tractor. Uh, it's going to have a completely different engine combination set up on it. It's something different that the pulling sport's never seen before. So we don't want to talk a whole lot about it at this point, but we are looking forward to getting it out and trying to work out some problems with it. Well, I hope we see it next season. Well, Tim Engler's got some secrets coming up, but the secrets he had were good enough for tonight as Engler wins it, followed by Norman, Patterson, Freeman, and then Pat Friels and the Dollar Devil, Boning, Carlton, and David Boning. But there is still more action as the monster trucks come to the line. 
for the final round. Can the Carolina Crusher take the measure of the seemingly unbeatable Bigfoot? You usually think of motorsports as lightweight, sophisticated machines. Well, the final two racers tonight are indeed sophisticated, but not lightweight. The Carolina Crusher against Bigfoot. The Carolina Crusher weighs in at 13,500 pounds, and Bigfoot at well over 10,000 pounds. We're ready to go. Bigfoot on the near side. Carolina Crusher on the far side. Gary Porter lays the power and jumps out ahead of Bigfoot, but Bigfoot jumps into the lead. You're looking out the front window over the first jump. Look at him lean out that window now. He has got a definite lead as Bigfoot makes the turn at the far end, but the Carolina Crusher seems to be catching up. The Carolina Crusher was in it all the way, Paul, until that tricky turn for the last stretch down. It is Bigfoot winning it, but bouncing all over the floor of the stadium. And look at the crowd. How many of those kids you figure out there, Paul, have got a Bigfoot toy at home, or will have after tonight? I'll tell you the job that Bob Chandler and this driver, Rich Hooser, have done tonight speaks highly of the professionalism of the TNT organization and monster truck racing now and in the future. What a job. I'm not sure that Rich Hooser is done, Paul Page. He's going to make a victory lap for the fans. Oh, do they love this truck. And you know, it is so understated, if that's possible, with a monster truck. Bigfoot and letters just a few inches high and about a foot long. They know that truck by a hundred yards away, they can tell you it's big, but they don't need to read it on the side of the truck. And look, the hydraulic hood opens up so the fans can see the chrome and polished supercharged 460 Ford motor. Bigfoot now pulls up the icing on the cake. Look at this. No one jumps like this truck. And with the pad on his arm hanging out the window is Rich Hooser. He takes quite a beating in that truck. But I, I think it's the jumping coupled with, obviously, his ability to use the four-wheel steering that right now contributes so much to their success. But they'll be the first to tell you, the team that operates Bigfoot, that the rest of the competition is catching up slowly but surely. Aerobatics like we've seen from Bigfoot are all part of the show and part of the action, but not moments like this. In fact, last weekend, Rich's teammate Jim Kramer rolled his Bigfoot truck. That's why they're so concerned these days with safety. Paul? Oh, Rich Hooser, you got it done. It was awful close going to the turn, though. Yeah, it was. It was a hard run. That Carolina Crusher runs good. We come off these cars, I think, pretty much about the same time. And he hit this corner a little quicker than I did. I had a little problem on the corner there, but I just kept it to the floor, and I passed him coming over this hill. And gave everybody down at the finish line a little thrill. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, the back end up in the air a little bit, and so I just wanted to gas it a little bit to bring it out. So I didn't want to do it like Jim Cramer did a few weeks ago with the other Bigfoot. And I uh, had them guys a little worried down there, but we had it under control. Bigfoot, King once again. Congratulations. Thank you very much. All right. Let's go to Steve Evans now, who is with second place, Gary Porter. Steve? Well, thank you, Paul. And certainly Bigfoot was again number one tonight. Uh, but this man, Gary Porter, the Carolina Crusher, you went after him. And everybody, well, a lot of trucks seem to be able to stay with him until they make that far turn. That seems to be where, where Rich enjoys the edge. Yes, that turn is very critical. Plus, uh, he's over horsepower to me, and the turn had a lot to do with it, and it's a good truck. I tell you, you guys have reduced those cars up there to absolute rubble. He has some cars that have had it this weekend in the hills, where they're getting us in the air, and when we land on the cars, we just destroy them. Again, good job, good show. Thank you. Okay. Paul? Well, we've had some great entertainment. Congratulations to our three winners. I'm Paul Page for Steve Evans. So long from Texas. The executive producer for American Sports Cavalcade is Harvey M. Palish. Produced and directed by John B. Mullen. Promotional consideration provided for and a fee paid by the Style Auto World Championship Team, the nation's premier source of fast lane fashions. Style Auto, the champion's choice for the style of your life.